and admit everyone in. We're expecting a full house. We can only allow a hundred. Um, so we've got nearly about a thousand people registered. Good. That's, a, that's incredible. Yeah. Okay, folks. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the uh, Islamic Courses Zoom session titled Book Review Discussion on Aurangzeb, the life legacy of India's most controversial king. I'm uh, very privileged to have Dr. Audrey Trushke from Reuters uh, State University in New Jersey. And it's hosted by our very own Professor Jonathan Brown, who is the Al Walid bin Talal Chair of Islamic Civilization at Georgetown. Okay, so before I hand it over to Professor Jonathan, who's going to introduce the speaker and the topic, for security reasons, please, 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 can I remind everyone, um, I'm aware there might be some trolls or something like that. If you're a troll, uh, the Badshah will be on your case. As you can see, my name's the Badshah of Sultan of Londonistan. But anyway, look, please, very important, please keep your phones, devices on mute. It is being recorded. Uh, very, very important. If you want a copy, leave your email address if you're not registered. If you are registered, you'll get a link. There is a Q&A session as well. Uh, all questions will be done on the chat uh, and you can raise your uh, hands as well on Zoom if you want to ask directly. It is an academic discussion, so please, please, please keep the questions relevant to the subject. If you haven't read the book, buy the book. Uh, otherwise, please listen and tune in. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Professor Jonathan. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody, and uh, thanks, Mizan, for inviting me. This is a chance for me to, um, well, I'll get to talk to an author whose work I have really enjoyed and whom I admire a great deal for her, not only academically, but her personal courage standing up for important causes. Uh, so I'm just going to. Uh, read uh, Professor Trushke's biography uh, first. So it's, um, this is from her webpage or from her faculty page. Uh, Audrey Trushke received her PhD in 2012 from Columbia University. Her teaching and research interests focus on the cultural, imperial, and intellectual history of early modern and modern India, 1500 to the present. Her first book, Exter um, Cultures of Encounters, uh, investigates the literary, social, and political roles of Sanskrit as it thrived in the Persian-speaking Islamic Mughal courts from 1560 to 1650. Her second book, which we're talking about today, Aurangzeb, The Life and Legacy of India's Most Controversial King, is a historical assessment of one of the most hated kings in South Asian history. Yikes. But also hated, but also beloved. You know, it kind of depends which team, which team you are. Are you on Team Aurangzeb or Team Not Aurangzeb? Uh, and um, it's published in India and Pakistan as Aurangzeb, Man and the Myth. She's currently working on a third book in, on Sanskrit literary histories of Muslim-led incursions and rule into India circle 11, circa 1190 to 1720. And her, uh, for those of you who care about these things, her undergraduate was from University of Chicago. And I have to, having been a graduate student there, I have to say University of Chicago undergraduates are some of the most uh, intelligent and intellectually precocious people you'll meet. So. Uh, she has a very fine pedigree that testifies to her capabilities in addition to her great publications. I recommend both the books. I, I really enjoy both of them. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to call Audrey Audrey because I'm a little bit older than her, but uh, we're around the same generation. And um, I'm gonna, if I try to say her name too many, last name too many times, eventually I'm gonna butcher it. So I don't want, <laughs> Audrey's, Professor Audrey will be easier. Uh, Dr. Audrey, can you tell us about your, you know, how you came to this field of study and your intellectual and your intellectual journey? Absolutely. So, salam alaikum, everyone. Thank you so much for, for having me here. It's really a pleasure to, to be chatting with all of you today. So how, how I came to this field of study, um, this is a sort of narrative and story of academic love. Uh, it's, it's a very University of Chicago story in that, that sense. So I went to college with the intention of studying religion, and I did. I majored in religious studies. At the outset, you know, when I'm 17 and I first set foot on the University of Chicago's campus, uh, I sort of, you know, I, I don't know if I intended, I just assumed I would study Christianity and Judaism uh, because I'm from the American Midwest and, and that's what religion meant to me at that point in life. That's what I had been exposed to. 
And then I took, I took a course on Hinduism, right? So the journey does start with Hinduism, not with Islam. And I took that with Wendy Doniger, who's a very well-known scholar. Um, and I, I was completely blown away by the Hindu stories, by conceptions of the divine, by gods who walked and talked on earth. Um, I was fascinated by it, and I also didn't understand it. I, I didn't have a framework for making sense of, of this very different worldview. And so I thought, well, that's my problem, clearly, and I need to fix that. And that, that's what began the journey. And the next thing you know, I had done four years of Sanskrit as an undergraduate. That's a more, that's a more normal thing to do with the University of Chicago than anywhere else on the, on the face of the planet. Um, and, and I had sort of gotten deep into the study of, of Hinduism. Along the way, I had also started to study Persian. And so then, you know, shock of shocks, four years of, of studying Sanskrit and a year of studying Persian did not translate into a particularly great set of job opportunities. So and as opposed to going into the real world and getting a job, I decided to go to graduate school. And when I sat down and thought about what I could do with my skill set, working on Hindu-Muslim interactions, Sanskrit-Persian stuff in some capacity is, is what emerged. Um, and so I built on the skills. And, you know, when you start thinking about Indo-Muslim history, the Mughals are sort of the best show in town, right? They're the biggest, they're the flashiest, we have the most historical information on them. Uh, and so I decided, you know, for, for my graduate work and, and for my first two books to focus on Mughal history. So it, it, it is very much an intellectual love. And at this point, I've been studying all this stuff for about 20 years. So it's a little hard to imagine it any other way. Do you, um, when you, you, you meant, you, you discussed this a little bit at the beginning of the, of the introduction to the Aurangzeb book, but did you, when you wrote this book, did you, uh, I mean, you must have had an idea of the, the sort of, uh, fraught terrain you were stepping into and how how did that I mean did that kind of motivate you more strongly to write the book when you were writing it how much did that weigh on your mind as you were trying to produce a work that was like both academically rigorous but also accessible so I would say it was absolutely formative um you know, I originally, I, I didn't have an intention of writing about, about Aurangzeb. I don't write about him in the first book. I think I have five pages that, in which I explain basically why I am not going to talk about him. Um, and then, it, you know, what basically happened is I, I made a couple of comments in an interview about Aurangzeb, um, and I felt like the world blew up at me. Like, I got, all, I got all these responses. People wrote letters to the editor. I didn't even know you could write to the editor to complain about an interview, but you can, apparently. Um, and so I thought, oh my gosh, we, we, have, we have a serious problem here in that Aurangzeb has become so politicized that people have this conception of him in the popular sphere. And yet, in academic circles, we've actually made considerable progress in terms of how we think about him. Um, and no one has bothered to translate that. No one's tried to bridge the gap. And so I thought, there's so much interest, why not do it? Right? So I mean, in a sense, I, me deciding to write this book was spurred, at least in part, by the political controversy surrounding him. Um, you know, and as historians, of course, you know, we may study the past, but no matter how far you're looking into the past, you are always standing in the present. Um, and so especially for a figure like Aurangzeb that is so entangled with mythology and bad information and, and you know, wrong ideas, I think it's important to sort of name those at the outset, right? So you can sort of, you know, peel it away to the extent possible to get back at, at the actual historical Aurangzeb Alamgir. And that's sort of how I approach things in the book. I start with the present and work my way back. I'm going to assume, considering our audience, I'm going to assume that they all know about why Aurangzeb is controversial and they, that no one needs to be sort of have this frame for them. Uh, so I'll, that'll uh, maybe allow us to get into like a more specific discussion. Uh, one of the things you bring up, uh, it's kind of, it seems struck me as a central theme in your book. Um, and, and Richard Eaton also talks about this in a little bit different way. He talks more about stability, whereas you focus on this idea of the Persianate idea of justice, so the circle of justice and the idea of a just ruler and how much this uh, how much this, you know, inevitably shaped Aurangzeb because of the tradition he came out of, and all, came out of, and also how you find so much evidence of his own personal reflection on his, you know, his performance as a just ruler in in his context. So how how you know this? One of the the ideas, uh, you know, the idea that Aurangzeb is this sort of um, you know this kind of fanged, bloodthirsty. Uh, uh, you know, bigoted uh, religious fanatic, um, and you know that he sort of destroyed the the the, Mo the Mughal state. Uh, how how I mean, how do you um, his he he becomes a very different person when you think about him as somebody who's actually not surprisingly interested in stability and justice. So how 
how would you, how do you square the the kind of the idea that he's committed to justice and stability with the uh, what people see as the effects of his rule? Mm, that's a great question. So I think part of the answer is in sort of thinking critically about what Aurangzeb meant by justice, right? It's, it's not our definition of justice. Um, and I mean, that's a very obvious statement, right? I mean, he was a pre-modern king. We are modern people. A lot has changed in the, in the last three or 400 years. Um, but, you know, if, if we don't sort of name and, and think more critically about it, it's, you, people tend to just transpose their own ideas. Um, so Aurangzeb's justice did prioritize stability. But, you know, you mentioned bloodthirsty. I wouldn't say bloodthirsty, but he had no problem slitting some throats to get what he wanted, right? And that's not because he was a Muslim fanatic. He was not. I mean, he was Muslim, not fanatic. It's because he was a pre-modern king, right? All pre-modern kings had no problem using violence to achieve their aims. It was part of the pre-modern state, right? That was part of the stability. Um, so, I, and that's something I explore in the book is, you know, trying to be clear that Aurangzeb's justice is different and, and to sort of look at what, what that actually means. So yeah, I don't know if that sort of answer answers that question. Um, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, do you think that, um, so how, one of the, I guess one of the big questions about Orangzeb's rule is why he spends, you know, several, de basically he leaves Delhi in, mm. I can't remember, like six, eight, 1680s or something and like never goes back. He spends the whole rest of his, his career campaigning in the Deccan. And, you know, why didn't he take better care of the northern part of the empire? Why didn't he allow his sons a chance to gain experience, um, you know, leading campaigns themselves and things like that? So, you know, why do you, you have a figure? So that would be one half of the question, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other half would be, Okay, well, if he's concerned about stability, why does he do things like, you know, he levies the jizya in a, in a, in a new way or a renewed way? And he, um, he does these, he, he takes these actions which seem to destabilize mm. his realm. Mm. And that if someone, if someone were, and some people, and you write about this in your book, so some people were even writing to him and saying, this is not right. You do, do not do, do this decision is, is destabilizing mm. things. It's a, th uh, that's an excellent series of questions. So for, let me start with the jizya. So Aurangzeb reinstitutes the jizya in 1679 after the tax had been abated for about a hundred years in the Mughal Empire. And as far as I can tell, outside of the ulama, nobody thought that was a good idea. Uh, you know, Aurangzeb's sisters thought it was a bad idea. His counselors all thought it was a bad idea. The Rajputs didn't like it. Like nobody was in favor of this except the ulama. And I am not entirely convinced of why Aurangzeb reinstituted the jizya. Um, and I, I signal that in the book by sort of offering several different theories and just basically saying I'm not entirely sure. Um, you know, and, and for, for the non-historians among us, this is sort of a normal thing that historians do, right? You know, I, I like to tell my students that historians don't work in absolute certainty. We work in varying degrees of certainty. And whereas I'm, I, ha I have a high degree of certainty about my views of Aurangzeb's justice, I have a fairly low degree of certainty about my, my views on the jizya. My best guess is that he was trying to placate the ulama. Um, and the, you know, the Mughals had had problems with the ulama. Basically, the ulama always wanted power, and the Mughal kings didn't want to give them power. And every king had their own way of dealing with this. And Aurangzeb, he liked to placate them. Um, and you know, the, the jizya tax collectors were all drawn from, from sort of the ulama ranks. They were a special group of tax collectors. And it, in addition to employing them, it also gave them an opportunity to skim off the top. And we, you know, we don't have great financial records from Aurangzeb's period, but what we do have suggests that the ulama did a little bit more than skim off the top. Um, it's possible that very little of the jizya tax ever got back to, you know, to, to sort of um, Aurangzeb's treasury. So the ulama are making out like bandits, they're happy. That solves the ulama problem. It, however, creates a mess of other problems. Um, what did Aurangzeb see those? I don't really know. Did, did he think about other ways? Presumably he thought about other ways to resolve it, but, but he never decided to act on it. Although he does uh, rescind the jizya for certain sections of his empire. Um, so, you know, around Bijapur, you know, in parts of the Deccan um, when, when things are rough. So he, there is some degree of sensitivity that this is a hardship on people, but, you know, at the end of the day, just because he was a successful king in many ways does not mean he always made the best decisions. Let me say something about the Deccan. 
So around the time they reinstitutes the jizya, Aurangzeb also leaves Delhi. He heads south, and as you say, he never he never goes back. Right? He never goes back north, and that marks him as different from basically all other Indo-Muslim rulers. Plenty of other Indo-Muslim kings, well before the Mughals even, had gone south to conquer territory, but they always turned back north eventually. And Aurangzeb doesn't do it. On a sort of personal level, I can tell you that Aurangzeb really liked the Deccan. Uh, he liked the heat, he liked the weather, he liked, he liked the, the fruits, um, and he, we know this because he writes about it. Uh, this was in contrast to his troops, who are largely from the, the north and absolutely hate the Deccan. So there's a sort of divergence of views there. At, in the, at the end of the day, it, I think that it's left me and all other historians scratching our heads, especially given that Aurangzeb came to power because he was a brilliant military strategist, right? That's how he won the War of Succession against his three brothers is, you know, it, it's like, a, like watching those almost two years, it's like a masterclass in military strategy. And then to just throw it all away and wander around the Deccan for two decades. I mean, it's just like, like what are you doing, right? Well, I mean, more, almost three decades. Um, and I don't know, maybe he was old. Maybe he wasn't thinking straight. Maybe he wasn't getting all the information. Uh, maybe he was just, he just hungered for land. That's what Beam Sain, who's a Caius, who sort of works for him on and off during these years, thinks, right? And I quote him in the book on this, that, you know, sort of no matter how much territory a king has, he will always want more. And so maybe Aurangzeb lost sight of what was going on up north. Um, but again, I do not have a great explanation for that. So just, just some what, what about the theory that he's just, he's so afraid of what happened, what he did to his father in the sense of, you know, he never wants to leave the army and he wants to keep the army continually, continually occupied so that it doesn't, you know, his, there's not sort of contingents of the army that are, it can be drawn on by his sons to do what was done to, to do what his, he did his father to him. Mm. So I, I certainly think that, that Aurangzeb sort of declaws the Mughal princes. Um, and, and that is not my theory. That is Munas Faruqi's theory um, that, that I, I sort of draw on his book on Mughal princes on that. Um, and I think that, that that's a pretty big component in sort of bringing about the end of the Mughal empire, at least the, the near end in, you know, the few decades after Aurangzeb's death. I don't know if that explains the army thing, though, because wings of the Mughal army are up north during the decade years, right? I mean, they're dealing with, you know, threats, you know, up in the Khyber Pass and, and all this sort of stuff. Um, you know, I think that Aurangzeb really liked conquering land. That's pretty clear. Maybe he really wanted to be there to see it himself. Um, maybe he was more concerned with the generals he had in, in the South. Um, and and there, there's evidence, especially in some of the later sieges that were not actually sieges. People were not following his orders. So he had good reason to be concerned. Uh, but I think, I think we have to conclude that he sort of he sort of lost sight at some point of or maybe it maybe that maybe lost sight is the wrong way to put it. His sights were set on gaining as much territory in the south, no matter what the cost, and no matter how insignificant that territory in the sort of big picture of the Mughal Empire. Um, and that just seems to be at odds with how every other Mughal king, including him in the first half of his reign, thought about things. Um one uh, a concept that you, that's really important in mobile history, you talk about it in your first book, and I think it, um, it's important in your second book as well, is this notion of uh, Sul Hekul. And, um, and you, you, met, you talk, I guess, uh, the universal peace, maybe it's called. Um, and you talk about it in your first book as a, both a way of you know, maintaining tranquility and uh, in the empire, but also of allowing the, it sort of, it also is a tool for the, the emperors to shut down ideas or re, especially religious ideas they don't like. So it's not, it becomes a, it's sort of like the, almost today when we talk about, you know, we are, we're, we're tolerant, but we don't tolerate intolerance and what intolerance is, is sort of very subjective and politically defined. What is the, the, the role of that in the Mughal empire? And then how does it, how does Aurangzeb understand it and how, does he change it or anything like that? Mm. So I'm going to preface this by saying that my views on Soleil Kul are not, not necessarily, they're certainly not universal among Mughal historians. There's a lot of debate about what Soleil Kul is um, and, and how we should view it as, as a sort of, you know, tool for understanding Mughal history. But in my, in my view, um, Soleil Kul is, is a sort of, it's a set of ethical practices and, and also political 
practices. Um, and it, it sort of has implications on the individual level. And like, you know, if you're following Silly Cool, you should live in certain ways and do certain things. But I am far more interested in the sort of wider political consequences. Um, and so, you know, for somebody like Akbar, who's sort of, he's sort of like the founding figure for, for Sulaykul cool and the Mughal Empire. You know, for him, this, this is a way for, for him as a political king to also exercise control in the ethical and religious spheres um, and sort of mesh those together with politics. And so, as you mentioned, there's an element of sort of who do we want to keep out Right. It's basically we want to be tolerant until we don't want to be tolerant anymore. Um, you know, so, you know, for Akbar, you can worship any God. It doesn't matter which God. It doesn't have to be his God. It can be another God. But it has, does have to be a capital G God. Right. No, no thousands of gods. You can have thousands of gods that are aspects of one God. Right. That view of Hindu thought is fine. But but, you know, you can't you can't just have just the, the, the thousands of gods. And you certainly can't have no God. That's a big issue with Akbar is what to do with the atheists. Um, and generally they just deny being atheists, otherwise they risk Mughal wrath. So this then continues, it continues through Jahangir and presumably through Shah Jahan, although very little, there's very little writing from uh, modern writing on sort of Sulaykul cool and Shah Jahan's period. And then with Aurangzeb, you know, I think that this is an area needing more research. Um, I, I, can't, I can't say I did a ton on this. Um, Sully Cole mainly comes up in my Aurangzeb book because there is a scathing letter written to Aurangzeb. We're not sure who wrote it um, about the jizya, which it, it accuses him of going against the Mughal policy of Sully Cole, which has you know, sort of enabled this multi-ethnic, multi-religious empire to succeed by bringing back the jizya. Um, and honestly, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure... I guess I'm still not sure entirely how to take that, right? Like, is that a rhetorical flourish? Is that actually a very strong grounded argument? I'm not sure. It's hard to know without knowing who wrote the letter, which does not appear to be something we're gonna be able to settle, so. I was, I was, I didn't know if I could ask you this question, uh, but then when you told me about your undergraduate work, I, I'm a, I feel more comfortable. I mean, one of, you talk about this in, in your, your first book, uh, you know, with Abu Fuzzle's discussion of, I mean, he almost has, and I think this in some ways, maybe even preceded by a little bit by Biruni, but this idea that, like, that some of these Muslim scholars got the idea that they understood that, you know, that, that uh, quote unquote idolatry is actually at the kind of high level is actually a monotheistic concept, right? That, uh, that, that mm. these, that, that it wasn't like, the, the the idols were a way of focus. They were, you know, trying to get to the same thing Muslims were kind of via the opposite path. Um, it, but one of the things that I, I think uh, you see a lot in the kind of, you know, Akbar versus Aurangzeb or Aurangzeb versus Darashiko uh, juxtapositions is that, you know, um, Akbar and Dar Darashiko are sort of, they're tolerant of India, you know, kind of writ large or Hinduism writ large, right? But, um, and I think this, also a theme that comes up in, in Supriya Gandhi's book on Dar Shikoh, which is, is it really, so for someone like Akbar or Dar Shikoh, are they really embracing Hinduism and Indian religion, or are they very specifically interested in what they see as monotheistic, um, kind of in a monotheistic elite, correct elite, or a monotheistic uh, head uh, you know like a elite thread or strand in hinduism or indian religion that they validate mm. so i think it, i think it depends on the thinker I, I suppose the simplest answer is that yes i think that they all had a sort of line beyond which they would not go right and i mean keep in mind we're talking about kings and princes right i mean you know Dara being the one exception to, to some degree, like these are not just people like kicking back, like, you know, living some life of the mind, right? I mean, these are people with like real world interest in holding on to political power. And, you know, I mean, Dara is somewhat of an exception to that. Um, and, and that doesn't serve him very well, right? I mean, his lack of practical skills is why he lost the war of succession. Um, you know, let me just say something though about Dara versus Aurangzeb and their approaches. Hinduism. So, you know, Dara Shikoh's sort of, you know, pursuits of Hindu ideas is very well known. You know, Himal of Bahrain, the, the sort of confluence of these, you know, two, two oceans, all this stuff. Um, and because of that, many people think that, you know, he had this great respect for Hindu thought. And he did in, in one regard. Um, but he also, 
I would argue, enacts a sort of violence against Hindu texts and Hindu ideas because for Dara, the, the sort of core point is to prove that Hinduism and Islam are the same, right? There is not a recognition of difference there or an appreciation of diversity, right? I mean, this is not the way we would go about, you know, respecting another religious tradition today. I mean, for him, he wants to say that, you know, the Vedas and the Quran are saying the same thing. Right. Um, and of course, that as opposed to, you know, more Hindu mindset. Now, Aurangzeb doesn't think that way. Right. I mean, I don't recall him saying anything that I've ever read about the Vedas, but I'm pretty sure he didn't think it was the same as, as the Quran. Um, essentially, I don't think Aurangzeb cares about Hinduism much at all. Um, and, you know, just a friendly reminder, when we talk about Hinduism, this is anachronistic, right? I mean, there, there is no Sanskrit word for Hinduism. Um, so people didn't talk about it in quite the same way back, back in those days. But for Aurangzeb, you know, if Hindus want to work for the Mughal Empire, that's great. If they don't want to work for the Mughal Empire, then they're enemies of the state. If they want to convert to Islam, that's totally fine. Aurangzeb liked converts all of the Mughal. Um, although Aurangzeb shows a sort of curious interest in making sure that conversion is genuine, there are cases where he rejects Hindu converts because he thinks that they're just like, you know, converting to get out of the jizya or something. Um, and there, there's even a case where uh, they, they, they sort of capture some, some, some enemy soldiers and they're the, the, um, the, the, the judge says, um, he's like, well, we'll kill them all at sundown unless they convert to Islam and then they can live. And Aurangzeb is like, get this Qazi out of my face, get another Qazi. I want another opinion. Um, and they get a second Qazi, and the second opinion is we just kill them all. No conversion option, right? So, you know, Aurangzeb is a king at first and foremost. Um, you know, he had no problem with Hindus practicing their religion and doing whatever they wanted unless they crossed Mughal state interests. Um, and when they did, Hindu temples were, for him, a completely legitimate temple, a legitimate target of punitive state action. And that's something that's very hard for many people to understand today. Um, but I think what you need to know really to get this is, is as follows. Hindu temples were political institutions in addition to being religious institutions. And that idea is very difficult for people to understand today because we think of religion as separate from the political sphere, um, even though it's arguably not, not quite that clear cut in modernity. Um, but you know, to say that somebody has politicized religion, that's a bad thing in modern times. And in pre-modern times, that was just like the state of the world. Um, you know, you could hit a Hindu temple, whether you were a Hindu or a Muslim king, as punitive state action, and that was fine. Um, you know, Aurangzeb also on the sort of the Islamic side of things, he performed his piety on a public stage, right? He had no problem using Islam and acting in certain ways is for the view of others um, in order to achieve it to sort of further his political goals as well. So the, the politicization does run both ways, if in the specifics it looks One a bit different. I think was, I was surprised by, it was, this is in uh, Supriya Gandhi's book, but this, that, so Dar Dara becomes at some point in his life, before he's king, or before he, the, the war of succession, he becomes a devotee of this uh, Hindu kind of ascetic named yeah. Baba Lal. And actually, Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb also become devotees of the, the Aurangzeb and you know Dara Shikoh are kind of just totally cut from different cloth and uh, that that you know that in a lot of ways maybe Aurangzeb's and you mentioned this in in, in your uh, in your book but you know that, that a lot of he's also positioning himself against his brother so. His brother's choices were as maybe important in dictating the kind of way that, that Aurangzeb portrayed himself as Aurangzeb's own inclinations. Hmm. I, I agree 100%. And I've, I, I offer that, I think, in both books as a sort of explanation for why Aurangzeb cuts off the remaining links between the Mughal court and Sanskrit intellectuals yeah. of the time is because Dara was into it, right? And, you know, given that Aurangzeb sort of takes over when Shah Jahan wanted Dara to be king, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta separate yourself from, from the other guy. And that's one way he does it, but he never fully breaks obviously with sort of taking advice from Hindus on, on various scores. Um, you know, even, even in the early 18th century when Aurangzeb is quite ill, he's still consulting with Hindu astrologers, right? He spends his sort of final, you know, at least several of his final years in, in the company of, of a Hindu wife. Right. Um, so he's still sort of surrounding himself with with these people in various ways. Um, 
Well, I guess one really quick specific question. Then I wanted to ask you another question based on something you said. Uh, how did the, I've always wondered this, how did the moguls justify marrying into women? Is it just like, you know, huh. I'm the king, I can do whatever they want. But I mean, huh. Muslims can't marry Hindu women. They can, well, they can have, because. Oh, well, you know, yeah, Hindus but are Ali Kitab. Kitab are not, uh, you know, even uh, let's say Majus, Maju, Zoroastrians, you know, Muslim men can't marry Zoroastrian women. So, okay, so I would say that this perhaps looks a little different in India, right? Like Hindus are widely considered, you know, even far before the Mughals to be Ali Kitab. And so you can have intermarriage. Like it's, it's not sort of a huge issue, especially for kings, um, you know, for commoners on the ground. I'm sure this looks a little bit different. Um, and obviously the gender here matters that it's men marrying women. Um, their Hindu wives did not have to convert. You know, for the Mughals, this was really a practical strategy, and it was a very good practical strategy. It helped ensure Rajput loyalty and submission to the Mughal state, right? Because, you know, a bunch of their daughters are like, you know, part of the Mughal family now. They have kids that are sort of half and half, all this sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think that this is a huge issue. Um, you know, there, there does arise an issue about the number of marriages, right? You know, it's supposed to be only four, but like, that's not nearly enough marriage number, you know, it's not nearly enough wives for, for the Mughal kings, uh, especially when you're using marriage as a political integration tool. So, you know, they just sort of disregard the ulama on that. It's good to be the king as like the, the oh, history of the world part one with Mel, Mel uh, Brooks movie. I don't know if, maybe I'm dating <laughs> myself, but the guy, <laughs> you should... Mizan saw it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, so the, so so the, uh, oh yeah. So then the other question. This is more intelligence, I think. Um, so, uh, Shivaji, the Maratha leader, um, mm -hmm. he and I'm I I, I I this is from a not from your book, but I want to ask your opinion on it. Um, he he kind of, uh portrays himself or positions himself as this kind of anti-Muslim, anti-Mughal, anti-Muslim defender of what he, he says, defender of, I'm going to butcher this, Hendavi Dharma Dharakla. Dharma Dharakla. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's wrong. So what he said, like, <laughs> so okay. To, I mean, to, to, I to, said it wrong, or the, or no, 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 no. The the idea is wrong. So okay, so um, so in sort of modern Hindutva thought, and for for the Hindu right, um, Shivaji is is he's like one of the great saviors of Indian history, right? He pushes back against the Mughals, you know. He sort of uses his resources well, um, and they imagine him as basically founding a sort of proto Hindu Rashtra. Right, you know, this sort of Hindu supremacist state that is the sort of, you know, one of the chief goals of Hindu ideology is, is to enact and achieve that. And we're essentially seeing it unfold in India right now. So uh, the sort of core problem with this, it's sort of the same core problem as people who hate on Aurangzeb, which is that, uh, you know, Shivaji was a pre-modern king. And this is like way before Hindutva and nationalism. I mean, India doesn't exist as a country, you know. Um, and so for Shivaji, you know, who he was, he he was he was basically a guerrilla war guy. Um, he did position himself against the Mughals, except when he allied with Shivaji. There is a brief period of alliance, um, but basically, you know, Shivaji thought that his military skills were sufficient enough that he could break from Aurangzeb's power and, and sort of build his carve out his own little kingdom. And he was right. You know, it works. You know, their brief alliance ends when Shivaji sneaks out in the dead of night and escapes from being under house arrest in, in the Mughal court. Um, and he remains on the run for the rest of his life. And he, you know, founds this little kingdom, you know, this in, in sort of Maratha territory and so on and so forth. Shivaji was not anti-Muslim, right? No more than, than Aurangzeb was anti-Hindu, which is to say not at all. You know, one of Shivaji's top generals was a Muslim. Uh, there's actually a battle where Shivaji and Aurangzeb are fighting, except that like the general leading Aurangzeb's army is Hindu and the general leading Shivaji's army is Muslim, right? Like religion was just not the, it, it was, it was just not the, the sort of determining identity factor in, in that relationship. I didn't see so. that in the film, by the way, Shivaji film. <laughs> shocking, shocking <laughs> on that, yes. <laughs> so, oh, uh, there's a quick question. What's the worst Bollywood movie about the Mughals? Oh gosh, well, I don't know. 
I think the worst on any in the on Indo Muslim rulers is that Padmavet. I couldn't even watch it. I I turned it off halfway through. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't subject my my eyes and my mind. That's about Aladdin Khilji, right? <laughs> yeah, it's really bad. Um, but look at me and on the Mughals. I'm so, I'm a total sucker. Like I love Mughal Azam. I mean, it's not really about the Mughals. I mean, that's about like a Nehruvian yeah. vision of India. Um, but um, you know, it's fun. tell us about. Aurangzeb's favorite chancellor, I'm going to, again, butcher the name, Raghun, Raghunatha. Uh, Raghunatha, yeah. So, the, yeah, this was like one of his like uh, sort of early Hindu leaders in his state. And, you know, we shouldn't call him a Hindu leader. He was just like a guy in the local state who happened to be Hindu. Um, and he was really good. And he dies pretty early. I think I'd have to look up, but I, I think in the, the sort of 60s, right, the 1660s. Um, and even 40 years later, Aurangzeb still is talking about this guy in his letters, right? Like, I've never found a replacement. This guy was so great. All of my state servants should be like him. Um, and it's very intriguing. I've never found an instance where Aurangzeb talks about the guy's religion or that he came from a different cultural background, maybe because he didn't really by that point, right? But, you know, um, it, it's really just, you know, this guy was really good with numbers and I really appreciate his contributions to the Mughal Empire. Um, what about uh, the, the, the role of uh, Rajputs in, uh, in the Hindu army and nobility and also just, you know, Hindu quote unquote, um, kind of administrators or Brahmin administrators in the Mughal Empire mm -hmm. and how did this did did Aurangzeb change this or leave it the same? Mm. So the sort of integration of Rajputs largely precedes Aurangzeb um, and he deals with a sort of you know a couple of major rebellions and that sort of thing um, but you know most Rajput families had been sort of clearly brought in into the Mughal fold before Aurangzeb's reign and Aurangzeb keeps them all in keeps them together one notable thing that, that Aurangzeb does is he increases Hindu participation in the Mughal nobility um, in, in terms of sort of a percentage. So Hindus were always a minority of Mughal administrators, right? And the, these ranks were always dominated by, by Muslims. Um, and again, you know, using these broad modern religious categories doesn't really capture why this was important, right? I mean, it was important to have, you know, Iranis and Tehranis and these sort of different types of, of Muslim groups within the Mughal state. And so Aurangzeb increases Hindu participation in the Mughal nobility, but largely by adding in Marathas, right? Um, and, um, and, and Aurangzeb takes a lot of it. And anyways, he ends up with, with a lot of Marathas under the Mughal umbrella. And so, you know, for the Mughals, once you conquer a group, then you need to integrate them into the state, right? To sort of give them skin in the game and, you know, help keep them loyal. And he does that. And the one group that actually has the biggest problem with all these new Marathas um, are, it's, it's not any Muslim group, it's the Rajputs, right? They're the ones that, that sort of balk at that. Um, and this actually goes back all the way to when, you know, Shivaji was sort of first brought before Aurangzeb's court during their moment of, of alliance. Shivaji did not come from the same cultural background and notably he didn't come from the same caste background as, as Rajputs and Rajputs did not like that. Um, and again, if we use the modern category of Hindu, it's very hard to sort of see that because it's like, you know, they're all Hindus and we talk about all Hindus together, but, but they did not see themselves as a unified group at all. Um what what is the this this uh, institution of the imperial historian? Uh, is that something that's um, unique to Mughal rule? Is it something that is you see a lot in uh, pre-Mughal Indian history? Uh, the idea that there's like a court mm -hmm. historian who writes, you know, he's not just documenting, um, you know, today this happened, today that happened, but is really putting a flourish or uh, narrative flourish on this. Mm. Yeah, it sort of comes and goes. Um, there definitely are formal court historians before the Mughals. Um, I don't think it's very consistent, but then again, it's not consistent during the Mughals either. So Akbar, Akbar was like super into histories. He had like a whole bunch of court historians and most people know Abu Fazl. He's sort of the last guy um, and the most famous and he sort of sets the narrative. But there's a bunch of people before that as well. Um, Akbar sponsors a lot of histories. And then Shah Jahan is also really into court historians and he has this sort of like formal position and Aurangzeb inherits that. Um, and so he has this guy for the first 10 years and he writes the Alam Girnameh, which we still have today. Um, and then Aurangzeb fires him, you know, and while, while the rest of the world, sometimes it feels like is, is busy being angry at Aurangzeb because of, you know, 
what they think he did or did not do vis-a-vis -vis Hindus. Um, I am angry at Aurangzeb because he fired his court historian, right? Like that, that's, <laughs> there, there is no greater sin in, in my eyes. And um, for the next 40 years, we have no official court histories of Aurangzeb's reign. We have unofficial histories and people writing on the sides and on the margins, but sort of no, no formal narrative. Um, and I don't know why Orange the fired his court historian. I'm really not clear. I have no insight into that. You know, I mean, the Algernon May is this like huge love, you know, sonnet to Orange Zeb. So I don't know what he would be upset about. But it was, I will say, it was not a big break with Mughal practice to sort of get rid of a court historian you didn't like. That happened a lot. Um, and I think Babur, Humayun, and Jahangir did not always have formal court historians. What about I think Jahangir won for a little while, but not. Always, yeah. What about ba Bakhtawar Khan's, uh, what is it, Mirati Alam, or uh, is that is that a court, official court history? Mm, I don't believe so, no. Or so it's so just yeah, like his, his yeah, own. Yes, I mean, yeah you, yeah, you have all these people sort of writing around the court. You have a bunch of histories produced after the Aurangzeb's death that, that are sort of, you know, somewhat official. Um, I think things get a little murky because we start having like kings in pretty rapid succession there for, for a while until Muhammad Shah comes to the throne, but what um what kind of uh, documentary evidence i mean for example these histories do they do they survive in um fairly old manuscripts are they just copied and copied and copied and copied uh and then besides these narrative histories what kind of documentary historical material do we have from, from the time of orange mm, that's a great question so orange is the most well documented mughal king that we have um, we, we have the most historical material on him by far. So for the, the histories, I mean, it's, it depends on the individual history, but we do often have manuscripts going all the way back to Aurangzeb's period. Um, so it's, it's recent enough in time that not everything's been destroyed from then. Um, the other great thing that we have on Aurangzeb that we do not have for earlier Mughal kings are the Akhbarat. And the, the Akhbarat are the news reports, right? So, I mean, th this was like your newspaper of the time. So basically, Aurangzeb had, had guys in like various courts and, you know, key places across his empire and beyond. And other kings did too, like Shivaji is doing the same thing and so on and so forth. And then these guys write like sort of daily reports of what's going on. They send them back to whoever's employing them. And, you know, it's sort of the way of keeping up on news and what's going on in all corners of the empire. And we actually have a lot of the Akhbarets from, from Aurangzeb's reign. However, they're not, in, they're not very accessible. Uh, I believe most of them are in Calcutta, possibly all of them, I'd have to check on that. Um, and it's a situation where you have to go and you have to sit there and you have to read them. And they're all in pre-modern Indo-Persian, of course. So you have to be a, you know, highly trained and a specialist and you have to have a lot of free time on your hands to go sit in Calcutta. And very few people have, have been sort of interested and willing and able to, to do that. I did not do that for, for writing the Aurangzeb book. So, that's really a story, I think, about modern accessibility and, you know, what happens when we have archives that, that are difficult to access. Do you think, do we have any, um, uh, you know, court, things like court, you know, legal court records from Aurangzeb's period? I mean, uh, outside of the sort of central administration's uh, record keeping, are there any, do, 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 do you know of, you know, judges or courts keeping legal records of Hmm. That's a great question. I know it's mentioned in the Akhbarets. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely sort of references in that. You know, the courts did keep records. I'm not aware if we have any of those. I feel like we do, but I can't say I'm super familiar with that. Um, I did dig a bit more for the financial records and, the, and those we just don't have. We don't have regular financial records. They, they existed, but they're gone. Um, you know, part of explaining that is that the Mughal library was sort of looted multiple times. Um, between mm. the end of Aurangzeb's reign and our time. Um, so that, that explains why some of this has been lost. Um, one of the, I think one of the challenges, I'll, I'll, this is the last question I'll ask. Um, I want to give other people a chance to ask. Is that, is that okay, Mizan? Mizan, by the way, you look like a, like a Pakistani a PIA like pilot or I'm something. About, I, I decided you look terrific. I wish I could, I wish I could <laughs> like that. You look like you should uh, be on bad Mughal memes. That's what yeah, you look yeah. like. No, I just take it off now. Now I'm no longer the bad chair, according to Jack. No, wait, keep your sunglasses on. You look terrific. <laughs> really, I'm admiring you. Okay. <laughs> I'm uh, um, so uh, one of the, I think one of the challenges is, you know, is if you're, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that historians are kind of propagandists or anything, but I mean, you're, you're, I agree with you hundred percent that, you know, one of the things historians have to do or should do is to try and 
make sure that the past isn't misused in the present. Uh, but one of the, the problems, you know, when we're talking about things like Hindu Muslim tensions and temple destructions and mosque destructions and all this is that, you know, you go back and you read uh, Mughal era history and, um, you know, the historian says, you know, Padishah so-and-so went and said, I'm going to destroy this temple because I'm Muslim and this is a Hindu temple and I'm going to destroy the temple of the enemies of God. And so, you know, some kind of Hindutva person could say, look, look, they said why they did it. I mean, I'm, I'm taking Muslims seriously. Here they are telling us exactly why they did this. Um, and I mean, I, maybe you can explain to us how, what, what a historian or what it would be correct to do in terms of reading behind these sources or how to read these sources. Hmm. Absolutely. So as I sometimes say this to my students, just because somebody wrote it down hundreds of years ago, doesn't mean it's true. Right. And I sometimes tell my students, like, imagine the exercise of someone coming along in 400 years and reading Donald Trump's tweets and just assuming it's all true. Right. Like, yeah. you, I mean, you would be in crazy land as opposed to like reality. Um, and so, you know, you have to separate out rhetoric from from reality and read all sources critically. So when you approach a source, you don't assume that it's true. You don't assume that it's false either, but you interrogate it and you ask, OK, what are the literary conventions I need to know? Right, because there are some things that we do and say that you know, it's not what what they mean. Right, um, you know, a, a good example in in American English is um, when you when you see someone, you say, "Hey, how are you?" You don't actually want an answer to that question. Okay, right, like that. You know, and this throws off people coming from other English speaking places. Right, it's, that's just how are you is just like how we say hi. It, it does not actually mean you're supposed to answer. Um, so you need to know, like, what are the conventions in writing this sort of text? Right. So, like, one convention that comes up in Indo Persian writing is you always begin with praise of Allah, and Hindus do it too. And it doesn't mean they convert it. You just you just do it. It's just like the way it's done. And there's like all this like all these Islamic phrases that come up. And like you know, a writer called Beam Sane is going to use it as much as you know a writer with a Muslim name. And, and that's just the way it is. And so for temple destruction, right? In pre-modern times, it was a good virtuous thing if you were a Muslim to claim that you went around destroying temples because you were doing jihad. And that that idea is offensive today. But you know what? History doesn't care about modern feelings. Like back in the day, this was just like something that was done. And so you know that. So when you read about temple destructions, you know, you, obviously your, your immediate guard goes up because you know that there's a lot of rhetoric and sort of virtue surrounding that discussion. And so then you look for evidence that can corroborate or not, right? So an easy one is that with some frequency, someone will write, so-and-so destroyed this temple. And then you look at it today and it's still there. And it clearly is, you know, before, dates before the 17th century or whenever they say they destroyed it. So it's like, okay, clearly we didn't destroy it, okay? Um, another thing we look for are round numbers. There are a lot of claims of destroying a hundred temples, right? Or something like that. History rarely works in round numbers. And so in the end, you end up with a sort of messy list of degrees of certainty, right? Um, and, you know, Richard Eaton's work is, is frequently cited and with good reason on this subject uh, and because he did very careful research. He came up with about 80 confirmed temple destructions in all of Indo-Muslim history, right? 80. Now, that doesn't mean that only 80 temples were destroyed. More temples than 80 were destroyed. We just don't know how many and we can't confirm them. We're pretty clear it wasn't, you know, 10,000 because there, there would be, a, you know, a sort of physical evidence that doesn't exist today, but maybe a few hundred. We simply don't know. Um, and so at the end of the day, I think what is most useful in these instances is actually to just reframe the discussion entirely um, away from sort of how do we feel about this and away from numbers and instead look at the why, right? And so for me, I do this in the Aurangzeb book by talking about why did Aurangzeb target this temple and destroy this temple and not the one next door, right? Because that's what historians have to do, right? You can't, you can't cherry pick. People who have politicized readings of the past and are, you know, politicians or WhatsApp, you know, university graduates or whatever, uh, they can cherry pick, you know, they can say whatever they want about the past, but real historians won't do that, right? Because it's unethical and it's, it's, it's not our job, right? So, so we have to sort of explain the whole picture. Why did some temples, why were some temples destroyed by Indo-Muslim kings, whereas most were not, right? That's the critical question. We've got loads of questions, Jack. So you've got someone okay. to but should we take so, part for the ones who are holding, they've got about, we've got about five people and they're holding their hands. So can I take the first really? one from Dr. Yusuf? I'll just unmute him, is that okay? 
Dr. Yusuf, please, very quickly. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions. I'll get to this. I'll get to this quickly. I just wanted to, Professor Audrey, thank you so much. I just wanted to come uh, ask you a bit more detail about the relationship between the ulama and the Mughals in general. You mentioned something about the relationship with Aurangzeb, but uh, in general, and also more specifically about the uh, compilation or the composition of the Fatwa al which of course is a major source for the Hanafi school of law, uh, even, even in modern times. Did you, could, you, could you maybe just talk a little bit about that and what maybe have the social political circumstances that sort of prompted that and so forth? Thank mm. you. Brilliant. Absolutely. So, so for the ulama and the Mughals generally, so basically both groups want power. Right. And, and the ulama have clear power on religious matters uh, in general life. And the Mughals had clear power politically in general life. Um, but both sort of wanted to encroach on the other. So, for example, during Akbar's period, the ulama, they definitely want to have a say in the sort of nature of the Mughal state. Right. So, for example, they're not happy when Aurangzeb starts reciting the, the thousand names of the sun in Sanskrit in order. And he does it at a time to coincide with one of the five daily you know, sort of Sunni Islamic prayers. The ulama are not happy about that. And they want to have the ability to sort of, you know, tell him to knock it off. Akbar, for his part, he wants to be able to do whatever he wants, but he also wants to have authority in religious matters, right? Uh, Akbar has, has a sort of very um, universalist vision of, of his own power, um, and it wants to exercise that in all realms. So he wants not only exceptions for himself, but he wants the ability to actually be the final authority on what is or is not a good idea. So for Akbar, he deals with this um, by, by treating the ulama pretty harshly, with Muslims present, but later with both Hindu and Jain and Christian representatives as well, um, where he sort of ridicules members of the ulama and just like makes like rampant fun of them in, in front of everyone else. Um, when the ulama were, were particularly problematic, uh, Akbar would just send them away. Um, and a couple of ulama are, are suspiciously murdered during his reign. Um, and that's actually something, the, the idea of sending them away. So the most classic way of doing this in the Mughal Empire is to send somebody to Mecca because Mecca is a long way away. So by the time you get to Mecca and back, a few years have gone by and, and you know, it's all fine. Um, and other kings do this too. In fact, Aurangzeb does this. Um, so one of Aurangzeb's first problems when he's won the War of Succession, it's been a little over two years, the sort of dust is just beginning to settle. So he needs the chief Qazi of the Mughal Empire to, to sort of sanction his kingship, right? And, and sort of play a crucial role in, in his, you know, ascension ceremony and all this stuff. And the Qazi who had been Shah Jahan's Qazi just says no, says absolutely not, like you're not a legitimate king. Um, and the issue there was not the war of succession, it was that Shah Jahan was still alive, right? So under Sharia as understood at the time, you could kill your brothers, no one had a particular religious issue with that, but you could not overthrow your father, that was a problem. So Aurangzeb fires the guy, and he appoints a more pliable Qazi, and that relationship lasts about 20 years before then Aurangzeb has to fire him as well, right? So, so that's a little bit on, on sort of the ulama. Um, the, the sort of law book, the Fatavoy Alamgiri. Um, so th this is compiled by a team of ulama. Several hundred religious scholars worked on that project, and I think that was part of the point, right? So... Whereas Akbar made fun of the ulama, uh, Aurangzeb preferred to just, just give them something, some, excuse me, just give them something to do, right? Placate them, provide them sources of income. Um, so the Fatah Vaya Alamgiri helped with that agenda. Um, it also did give a sort of standard law book, um, which was important to Aurangzeb's vision of justice. Um, and and the, it, was, it was a practical tool. It was used in sort of courts across the empire. The last thing I'll say about, about that project is that I think it's actually a good example of how Aurangzeb sort of continued Mughal kingship practices while putting his own stamp on them. Um, and what I mean is that earlier Mughal emperors had done these sorts of large scale textual projects, right? But whereas we look at Akbar's period and we see this done with histories and with translations of Sanskrit text, for Aurangzeb, he sort of channels this in, into, into a law code and more of a justice mode. Up to you, Jack, who the next person is. You can either do a chat. Or um, can... Yeah, I'm, there's a lot, I'm getting a lot of uh, messages privately in the chat. Um, so one, one message, uh, or maybe I'll give you two questions. You can kind of pick how you want to answer them. Uh, one is, uh, how, how did the 
you know, were, were the Mughals a colonial power and how, how could we kind of look at them differently than, than the British uh, control of, control of, um, of India? And uh, then why did the Mughal Empire decline rapidly after yeah. Aurangzeb's death? So the Mughals were not a colonial power. Um, so w they were a bit early for one thing, but also colonialism is, is really defined as a sort of extracting relationship, right? Where, where someone who is based in another place comes along and sort of takes away some of your resources. Um, that's not what the Mughals were, right? The Mughals originally were conquerors, right? And, and I mean, you know, they were a land-based empire that never changed, right? Conquering territory never changed, but they came to India and they never left, right? I mean, you know, they, I mean, there's, I, I suppose there's probably still like a blood legacy in, in some regards there. Um, so I think it's much more accurate to think of the Mughals as an imperial power, right? So I want to be clear that, you know, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't call the Mughals a colonial power, not because we want to like, you know, make them into some, you know, pretty group that's sitting around singing Kumbaya or something. That's ridiculous, right? We, it's, it's simply, it's, it's an inaccurate description of, of their... Um, of, of, of sort of their, their political processes, right? Imperial is, is far better there. Um, why did the Mughal Empire decline? I don't know. I think it's a million dollar question. Um, I don't think, you know, historians have long, got, I think, done away with some of the really bad explanations, right? You know, it's not because they were decadent or something like that. I mean, that's a very colonial uh, way of looking at things, very orientalist. Um, you know, I think Aurangzeb probably had a little something to do with it, but I don't know if he had everything to do with it. Um, honestly, I think that questions of decline in general are poorly dealt with in historical question of sort of what happened to the Mughal Empire and why. Um, somebody asked about Princess Zebunisa. I actually don't know who that is. She, she was treated unjustly, a genius and a woman in her own right. Any thoughts on yeah, Zabun? Yeah, yeah, you know, Zabun is an interesting character. Um, you know, I, I talk about various female members of, of the Mughal family in the book. Um, to be honest, that that is, I don't know if it's a regret. If I were writing the book all over again, I would include more on, on female figures. I actually think it's a weakness of the book is that I don't say enough about women and their role. Um, but if you're interested in, in Zebunisa, there's definitely writing on her and there's some of her own writing as well, um, some of which has been translated into English. Should we take some questions from the um, Zoom? Jack, which one do you, do you want to take? We've got Moiz Mohammed, Harun Sidat, or Shafa Awali. Up to you. I think Moiz was first. Should we take Moiz? Um, why don't you, why don't you, who, who, who do you want? Who, do you, who should pick them? You, because I can. You're the chair, I, bro. You can you can unmute people, so you should do it. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you you have the muting and unmuting power. So right, you, I'll do more. You should thing. just pick people. Okay, yalla. Moise, it's your turn. Okay. Uh, thank you for the talk, uh, Dr. Audrey, and uh, for the questions, Dr. Brown. My question was about films. Um, do we see a lesser proportion or a number of um, history films in Bollywood compared to the number of history films we see in Hollywood. And if so, is that because the role of history in India is too you know, contentious for filmmakers to deal with, especially pre-BJP era? Um, how would you explain that? You know, I suppose I've never, I've never thought of it comparatively. Um, I don't know, are there, are there more films in Hollywood or Bollywood? Um, I mean, it seems, you know, it, maybe it's just my own interest. It seems to me there are, there are a fair amount of Bollywood films. Almost looking, looking at Indian history. I mean, maybe it's just that I like watch all of them. I don't know. Um, you know, I think, I think it's hard. I think it's hard to know what to do with pre-modern stories, especially in an art form that is, is sort of modern stories are so dictating, right? You know, so many, I mean, obviously, Movies of filmmakers, um, but they're modern, right? You have to know of love or of betrayal or so on. So it doesn't work. So, yeah.
is something off the top of my head, the most recent scholarship on, on Aurangzeb, um, I would direct you to Richard Eaton's India and the Persian World, um, which is a sort of, you know, more sweeping history of sort of all of Indo-Muslim history, but one entire chapter he devotes to Aurangzeb. Um, which is appropriate given given sort of how important Aurangzeb is, I think, too, to the narrative and and to the formation of, of you know South Asia in that period of time. Um, and that book came out, I think, in 2019, um, maybe late 2019. So, you know, that that's sort of going to be your most recent Aurangzeb take. Okay, we have another question for uh, Shafia Wani. Let me just unmute him. Hello, Mr. Wani. Hello. Go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you, Professor Andrea. And thank you, Jack Kojam, for the wonderful discussion. Uh, uh, I just have two questions. Uh, uh, Professor Andrea. Uh, first, uh, I would like to ask uh, the Hindu religion, uh, how do you see uh, the, the, the but they were asking who's going against uh, Mughal rule, uh, they would perpetuate violence because it was a legitimate form, form of political violence and all. Now, Hindu forces are in India uh, are saying that the 40,000 temples that were like, uh, uh, you know, raised to the ground and the mosques were erected on it. And, and you recently, you know, Babri Majid Wode say like, uh, this is like, the, this is like just an example. Uh, Kashi and Mathura temples are yet and now uh, in, in case of Kashmir as because it was an earlier uh, Hindu territory and then a lot of the temples they say a uh, lot of the temples in India are basically manufacturing on it online. Uh, but my uh, beyond this, but my question is a bit different. Recently, Turkey uh, uh, came up with the Bab with Hagia Sophia decision, and many it generated a great debate in India. Uh, a lot of the people said that uh, it's it's Hagia Sophia decision is the Babri Masjid movement of uh, India, and many this many said that since it's it was the, the conversion was happening or conversion of a mosque to. Uh, to the museum has happened in the modern times and in international law. So the decision to revert it back to the mosque uh, 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 is basically a decolonial movement. So how, how do you contextualize all this? Mm. So great, great questions there. Uh, so let me start with sort of Aurangzeb's place in nationalist historiography. So Aurangzeb is always the villain. Right. The, the sole exception to that is is in modern Pakistan, where he's sort of the hero. Right. Uh, but for everyone else, for everyone in India, Aurangzeb really is the villain. Right. This is not something that is limited to the Hindu right. Um, it's true in nationalist historiography as well. You see it in the writings of Nehru. You see it in other people's writings. You see it even today. I mean, you know, the Congress Party. You you know, they use Aurangzeb as a slur, just like the BJP does. If you know, if slightly less frequently, but still, um, you know, you see very left leaning people. You know, I won't name them, but there was just a guy on Twitter like last week who used Aurangzeb as you know as a sort of slur, this like worst example of you know what what can happen. Um, but in any case, so to me, you know, where I come into this. I don't care about nationalist historiography, right? I'm, I'm not an Indian nationalist. In fact, I'm not a nationalist of any stripe, right? I'm not an American nationalist either. Um, nationalism is, is, is a sort of dirty word so far as I'm concerned. Um, and so I'm not gonna hold up Aurangzeb as a villain to support some nationalist history that can you know, bring India together or something if I don't think it's historically accurate, right? That's, you know, my, my sort of ethical obligation is to try to understand the past on its own terms. Um, and you know how that works into nationalist history is that is not my problem. That is, that is not my interest at all. Um, so no, that, that's got kind of harsh answer, but it's a very honest one. Okay, in terms of temples and all this stuff, so let me let me say a couple of things. One, so 
yeah, a lot of mosques uh, stand on the remains of former temples, uh, Hindu temples, Jain temples, and Buddhist sites as well. Um, just because you build one religious site on another doesn't mean that you destroyed the former religious site, right? It was pretty common to sort of roll into town and find like a temple in disrepair or maybe just the site of a, an old temple and no one's using it. And then it's just like free building material. Um, and other religious groups did this too, right? Muslims didn't come up with, with that. Uh, you know, Hindus would do it on Jain temples, you know, J you know, Buddhists would do it, everyone sort of did that. So, you know, one has to be careful with material evidence in that regard. But in terms of the Hagia Sophia, so, I mean, I, you know, I haven't studied that decision, um, you, know, we, uh, you know, in sort of semi-lockdown life, frankly, we have, we have a lot going on here in the US. Um, but, you know, I guess a couple of sort of preliminary thoughts. One is I don't think you want to be following modern day Turkey right now, right? I mean, Turkey is like an authoritarian state that's going after their academics and their journalists. I mean, the horrible stuff. Um, like, I don't think that's, that's a good model. Um, you know, I think that I don't have a clear like vision or blueprint of what we're supposed to do with these sites today. Um, but I think we should treat them according to sort of modern, you know, uh, modern values and modern visions, right? The goal here is not to turn back the clock, right? The goal is not to go back to the past. The goal is to move into the future. And we want, at least I want, a future that is welcoming of all faiths and all religion and great diversity, right? Not one that seeks to sort of reconstruct some bastardized vision of the past. Jack, you got some questions on the chat? Um. One thing, one thing I thought was interesting, I don't, I don't know if it makes sense as a question though, but uh, comparing Aurangzeb and Tipu Sultan. And the other one was uh, uh, some questions about uh, or, uh, Mughal relations with, Indi with England or Britain, East India Company under, and during the time of Aurangzeb. And also, were there any indications of cha change in technology maybe especially military technology that appeared during Aurangzeb's time, especially in comparison with, with uh, Europeans. Hmm, that's interesting. So, okay, I have, I have nothing particularly insightful to say about Aurangzeb versus Tipu Sultan, so I'll just sort of leave that, leave that alone. I know that they are both figures that, that really enliven, you know, imaginations today, and that's great. Um, but, you know, with comparison, you have to have a reason for comparing, right? What, 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 what would I seek to gain? from comparing those two. Um, I, I'm sure there are answers to that question, but I don't have them currently. So, so I'll leave that one alone. In terms of relations with Europe, yes. Uh, the Mughal Empire had all sorts of relations with Europe, both formal and informal. At this point in history, mainly Europeans are still coming to India, not the other way around. Um, and that's because India was where it was at, right? India was wealthy, they had sophistication and culture. You know, no, no one wants to go to this, you know, cold, bitter island, um, right? And like, see what's going on in Britain at this point in time. So yeah, so you have all these European travelers, you do have formal relations, uh, the British are able to conduct trade. There are Portuguese, there are French as well. Um, there's even some skirmishes, you know, sort of sort of on the west coast of India, Orange Zeb's army gets involved at, at certain points. Um, all of that I sort of le leave off in the book. Um, and that's because it's a short book. And so I couldn't cover everything. And that was actually part of the design of the book. I mean, I wanted it to be short because I wanted it to be, to be readable and reach a wide audience. Uh, but I also wanted it to be short because I didn't want to say everything that there is to say on Aurangzeb Alamgir, right? The last guy who worked on Aurangzeb, Jadunath Sarkar, made that error, right? Jadunath Sarkar was, he was very good in many respects. I draw on his work throughout, throughout the book, but he said too much, right? He, I mean, he wrote a five volume history of Aurangzeb along with like numerous other books on the guy. And then just no one wrote about him for 50 years because how are you, how are you gonna match that? Um, I don't want the final, the final word on, on Aurangzeb in that regard. In terms of technologies, um, you know, I, I'm not a military technology person. I, I, I would be hard pressed to sort of come up with specifics on that. Um, but I do know enough to, to at least appreciate Aurangzeb's uh, military tactics and strategies, at least in the first 30 years of his reign. Great, I've um, got a question from Rizwan. He's been waiting for ages. So I'm sorry, Jack, I have to. All right. <laughs> sorry. Rizwan. Please just make it one question. You've got half a dozen questions or about something. Oh, I, actually, I wish to ask um, a couple of questions, but 
um, they're related. Um, but I, I'll, um, I, I'm, my question was about intolerance. I mean, is, is there any credence to this view that Aurangzeb was intolerant? Or intolerant because um, there were a few things he did, like um, his persecution of uh, the Ismaili Buhras, um, you know, his um, imposition of the jizya tax, um, also um, uh, uh, the, the, a few, uh, uh, and, 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 and the other thing is related to that, um, uh, the, were there theological motivations to the execution of, um, because political reasons are given, but are there reports of um, religious reasons why he executed uh, Guru Tegh Bahadur, Sarmad, and even his brother, Dara Shikhu? So let me, let me speak first on intolerance. So I think in a sense, it's fair to call Aurangzeb intolerant. I think basically all pre-modern kings were, were intolerant. I'm not convinced it's the most sort of, well, accurate. It may, it, I'm not convinced it's the most sort of useful historical framework, right? Um, you know, I think because I think any pre-modern was intolerant according to sort of modern ideas of, of toleration. Um, in any case, I think, you know, the jizya in general, people didn't have a problem with discriminatory taxes, I think, in pre-modernity. Uh, but the Bohras, the Ismaili Bohras, that, that is a better example and a, and a more pointed one. Um, and it is true that Aurangzeb persecuted them sort of throughout his, his, his sort of life and, and uh, you know, tenure as king. I mean, he starts as a prince even with them. And I think that, I think Aurangzeb certainly, um, like many people, uh, cared more when, when it was other Muslims. Um, and that, that's a theme that comes up with earlier Mughal kings as well, right? You know, if you're over there, you know, doing stuff as a Hindu, like, you know, I as Aurangzeb the Muslim may, may think, you know, you're, you're getting some, some stuff wrong, but at least you're like doing it as a Hindu, right? But I mean, if you were claiming to be a Muslim, and I know what Islam is because I'm Aurangzeb and I'm a pious Muslim. That is actually a much greater threat. Um, so I think that's perhaps part of why he he goes after the Bohras so so hard is that he perceives it, you know, as the people closest to you in the sense that it can be the greatest theological threat. Um, I'm also not convinced that I'm entirely clear on the full story on that. Um, you know, and, and there has been further work. I think Samira Sheikh has, has a very good article on, on the Bohras that goes into much further detail than I do in the book on that. Theological reasons for executions. So it depends on who you read and it depends on who we are talking about. So for, for Aurangzeb's brother, for Dara Shikho, there, there's a story that, that Dara was declared an apostate, right? That, that he had turned his back on Islam and that's why he's being executed. This is mentioned in some versions of the execution, but not in all versions. In contrast, all Mughal sources detail the war of succession. Right. So everyone agreed on the war of succession. Everyone agreed on the political struggle, like as a fact that this happened and, you know, Aurangzeb won and Dara is then executed. Some people wanted to also add a theological justification, but not everyone. Right. Was there an actual theological justification? I don't know. It's possible. Um, Aurangzeb preferred to have other reasons for killing his brothers, even though he didn't need them. That also is, comes up with uh, Prince Murad as well, the other brother that he killed. Um, you know, Murad rots in prison for a few years, and then Aurangzeb uh, comes up with this, like, he says, uh, Murad murdered some guy like a decade ago. Which is true, but I mean, like Murad was a Mughal prince, like this is not that, that huge of a deal. Um, but that's why he, he has him executed, uh, overdosed on opium water in that case. And it's one of those, it's, it's a little baffling, honestly, because Aurangzeb didn't need a reason to kill these guys. Like he won the war of succession, he could have just executed them. Like it's, yeah, I mean, it's brutal, but it's fine, um, you know, in the, the sort of, you know, for the time. Uh, but he preferred to have other reasons. For Guru Tegh Bahadur, so I, we do not have great Mughal records on what happened there. Um, I, honestly, I don't think that this was that big of a deal from Aurangzeb's perspective. And I say that with full knowledge that, you know, modern day six, uh, you know, view this execution in a particular way. And it, it's, uh, you know, sort of formative part of their religious story. But honestly, I, for, from a Mughal perspective, I think Guru Tegh Bahadur was just another enemy of the state that needed to be dealt with. Um, Essentially, I think for someone like him, it's, it's not that there was a religious reason for the execution, but it is the case that his religious status did not save him. Aurangzeb didn't care 
that he was a religious figure. That gave him no special protection. He's causing unrest in the Punjab. That's it. As soon as the Mughal army gets his hands on him, the guy's head's coming off, right? You know, it, so it is brutal, but, but not sort of religiously targeted. Jack, I know you said you've got to leave uh, very shortly. We've got a lot of questions still coming through. So uh, it's your shout. I mean, I think I, can, day. I think I can mm. stay. I, I, there, there, there was some like horrible noises coming from downstairs earlier, but you can see they're calmed down, which is usually bad news, actually. It's but your birthday, bro. We don't want to. Gary, uh, my wife, is taking care of these things. I, I could have <laughs> got some Mitai for you, some Jilabi, orange <laughs> style, but I mean. What can we do? We've got one question from Danish. He's been waiting for a while. Uh, can I unmute him if that's okay for you? Danish. Your question, please. Hi. Hi, Audrey. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I, I actually live in Aurangabad and I visit Aurangzeb's uh, Mazar quite often. And I also sit in Shahi Masjid, which he built, uh, which he used to sit in. Um, I find it peaceful. So Aurangzeb, uh, uh, two questions, uh, sorry. Aurangzeb imprisoned Shah Jahan for extravagance with Taj Mahal, if I'm not wrong. And um, I mean, I want to check that. And uh, my, my primary uh, question is, was Taj Mahal a symbol of love for Shah Jahan or was it more to do with aesthetics and tasawwuf? And second, did Aurangzeb identify Ottoman Empire as a trans-global caliph? And if yes, uh, um, did he like, submit or, or something like that like you know the narrative of the ottoman caliphate so mm. did orange say by then that that's it thank you so much okay mm. so starting with shah jahan no he did not imprison him for extravagance with the taj mahal that, that's a modern myth um so what happened is that shah jahan fell quite ill in the fall of 1657 Okay. And remember, I talked about these news reports that, that people would, you know, send back. So all the princes had like their own network of news reports. So Shah Jahan falls ill. Um, and we know, and he, he, he's found to be ill pretty quickly because he stops appearing in the Taroka. Okay. The, this sort of, um, this like Hindu adaptation, this like little window sort of at the top of a palace, the Mughal king would appear to his subjects often at sunrise, right? It creates this like nice light halo effect, right? So it's sort of like semi-divine showing thing. So Shah Jahan did this uh, every day, and he didn't do it for a couple of days. So everyone knew that he was ill. And all the news reports go back. Uh, he has four adult sons, uh, one of whom, Dara, is with him at the sort of Mughal court. Um, but the other three are in corners of the empire in Bengal, in Gujarat, and in the Deccan. They all know that he's ill, and he's expected to die. So they prepare to fight, right? Everyone knew there would be a war of succession. The only questions were when and who would win. So they fight the War of Succession. It takes almost two years. But in the meantime, uh, Shah Jahan has very inconveniently recovered from his illness, okay? Uh, he was supposed to die. He was on death's doorstep, and then he, like, gets better. So this is highly inconven inconvenient uh, because the War of Succession would not have started if he, at that point in time, if he had not fallen ill. They expected him to die, but now he's better. So now what do you do? So, I mean, Aurangzeb didn't really have a choice. I mean, what, he's really going to give power back to dad now that he seized it, right? Like, he's a prince who wants to be king. Like that goes against everything that, that, that Aurangzeb has been and wants to be in his life. So he does the only thing he can. He throws him in jail, right? And, and sort of, you know, locks him up and throws away the key. Um, you know, and some say that, you know, Shah Jahan had a, this, you know, sort of view through the window of the Taj Mahal. I mean, who knows? That, that's very romantic, but I don't know if that's true. Um, but he does, he does keep him under lock and key for seven and a half years until Shah Jahan dies. And that's, that's an, a problem for Aurangzeb. Uh, basically, leaders across the rest of the Muslim world will not recognize Aurangzeb as king because he has overthrown his father, because that's against Sharia. Um, so he sends these gifts to the Sharifs of Mecca, and they send them back. They're like, dude, you're not the king. Shah Jahan's the king. Um, I think it's the Safavid ruler, I think I quote this in the book, writes him this like, great letter where he says, you claim to be Alam gear. You claim to have seized the world, but really you're just paid out of gear. You just, you know, locked up dad. Um, <laughs> okay, Taj Mahal is a symbol of love. So there's a whole book on the Taj Mahal by Eba Kok, if you're interested, uh, that sort of deals with these issues. The, uh, you know, the Taj Mahal is a lot of things. I think the best reading is probably that it's sort of a representation of Islamic paradise. Um, that, that seems to me to be, to be the best thing going on there. Um, you know, I don't think you build something like that just just because you really loved your wife, but you know, it was his favorite wife. 
I go in for multiple explanations for things, as do most historians, so it can be more than one reason. In terms of Aurangzebs and the Ottomans, no, I don't think he recognized them as caliph. Why would he, right? I mean, that's, I don't think that that's sort of going, going with his, his mojo and all of that. Um, I'm, not, I'm not aware of anything like that. The Mughals and the Ottomans had relations during this period, um, but no, no submission, that's for sure. Thank you so much, Audrey. Also, I think it's worth remembering, and Richard Eaton talks about this in his book, that the Aurangzeb's campaigns, I think his three, he does three campaigns into like to Kandahar, costs like many, 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 many more times the amount of money that the Taj Mahal costs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, spending money is like not a problem. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, um, this is actually something I don't really quite understand how this happened, how Aurangzeb sort of got this reputation as like, you know, sort of a light spender, right? I mean, some people, you know, people say he sewed prayer caps and like that's all the money he lived on. He was the richest man alive during his time. Right. He was he I mean, he was the billionaire of his day. Who is one whoever lives in Aurangabad, can you give salams to the or give say a prayer on my behalf at the grave? Oh, I will. I will say, to dua lil mayat. I like that. Okay. Thank you. Oh. I'm a big fan of yours. Okay. Thank you, Danish. Over to you, Jack. Some questions. Yes, there are so many questions. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, um, let's see. Somebody asked about. Uh, well, actually, you kind of covered that already. Covered this already. Um, covered that already. There's no one else who has their hands up for like a live question. Not yet, unless they want to. If anybody wants to raise their hands, please don't hesitate. Well, I, I guess I have a question. I mean, I have tons of oh, questions, yeah. but I mean, I could yes, just go on have. forever. Okay, we've got Wait. someone. Uh, let me just unmute the person. Uh, you've got to show yourself on camera as well. Okay, Mr. Hash, Hashvaranda. Go ahead. Yeah, is it visible? Yeah, I'm sorry for the bad visibility of the camera. Camera is broken. <laughs> sorry for that. I mean, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Arby. I mean, it was a very compelling book. And uh, I loved reading that. So I have two questions. So I've seen uh, uh, India painting a very, uh, uh, I wouldn't say in a limited palette. You know, you have uh, white and black and probably, I mean, it's a sort of like a Caravaggio kind of part of, you know, portrait where uh, everything stands in the shadow. So. Uh, what I want to know is, uh, uh, since Aurangzeb also fought against uh, Shia Muslims in, during Dakkar, so what was the what was the the, the, the opinion about the opinion from the ulama and the Muslim religious heads, or even from the caliphate uh, regarding that? Because uh, I mean, in, 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 I don't think there is any reference to Shias and Sunnis in uh, uh, Holy Quran. So, what do you uh, make of that? I mean, what was the opinion about uh, 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 from from the, the the ulema regarding that? What was their take? Okay. And uh, and what was the contemporary picture of uh, our contemporary European picture during his times? Thank you. Yeah, like because in Tipu Sultan, we know that uh, he was you know in British Parliament he um, he was being represented many a time. I mean the there were like you know many caricatures, but whereas in Aurangzeb we don't know. I mean how he was represented. So I just wanted to know regarding how uh, it was represented. It was a nice presentation, by the way. Sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So okay, so l let me start with the Deccan. Um, so so yeah, so Aurangzeb uh, takes over both Bijapur and Golconda, right? So two sort of separate, independent Muslim and Shia kingdoms in the Deccan. Um, and there, so there's a story that I think sort of well exemplifies uh, sort of what the ulama think and what's going on here. So at one point during the siege of Bijapur, um, so the siege was, it was a true siege, right? There are about 30,000 Bijapuri soldiers. They're sort of locked in this fort, nothing in, nothing out. So they're being starved of food, water, medical care, everything. And several months into the siege, right? I mean, disease is running rampant. People are dying in massive numbers. There is a small delegation of theologians from Bijapur that go before Aurangzeb, and they, they appeal to him as a Muslim. And they say, look, you're a Muslim, we're Muslims, 
war one Muslim warring against another is unjust. It goes against Sharia. And Aurangzeb essentially has no answer, right? Because they are correct, as, as everyone understood Sharia at this point in time. They, they're, they are, they're, they're right in terms of their argument. Um, but Aurangzeb, when his faith and his piety and religious beliefs conflicted with his thirst for earthly power, he always chose power, right? This, this was not like we sometimes went one way, sometimes went another, right? Like he was a king first and foremost. Um, and so he just sent the theologians away and he continued his siege. And it ended when the, the Sultan of Bijapur was the last Sultan of Bijapur. And he bowed low in the dust before Aurangzeb's feet and gave over everything as an unconditional surrender. And by that time, many, yeah, I think more than half of the 30,000 soldiers were dead. So, like I said, Aurangzeb was a pre-modern king, right? I mean, you know, you think about him in modern times, not a very likable guy, but we don't study him to think about whether we like him, right? We study him to, to understand him. The European picture, that is an interesting one. So, you know, there, there, is, there is, as you say, I mean, there are various representations and discussions of Aurangzeb. He's thought of correctly as an incredibly wealthy and incredibly powerful king. Um, even at, at this sort of early stage, right, late 16th, early sorry, late 17th, early 18th centuries, you, you're really ha seeing Orientalist ideas already start. Um, so he is sort of seen very early through this lens of sort of, you know, decadence and extravagance and all this sort of stuff. But he's also just seen as very powerful. Um, and you see that particularly there is a play by John Dryden, who is the poet laureate of England uh, for at least some of the period that Aurangzeb's on the throne. And he writes a play called Aurangzeb. Right? So it's how we usually spell Aurangzeb today with an extra E at the, at the end. Um, and it's this sort of crazy picture of Aurangzeb. Among other things, Aurangzeb is an atheist. Um, so sort of totally lost the whole Muslim side of things. Um, but he is a very powerful king. Um, and it's sort of exploring that aspect. So Europeans are, are thinking about Aurangzeb. They're interested in him, um, certainly much more so than, than the other way around. Right? There's still pretty limited interest in India about what's going on in Europe. Over to you, Jack. Got some more chat questions you want to take? Um, or add your own, whatever. Yeah, uh, one question is, uh, and this might be, this, this is a very specific question. Uh, how effective was the Fatawa Alamgiri in providing a codified Hanafi legal system for the Mughal Empire? My understanding, okay, and I, and I do rely on secondary scholarship on this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a cultural historian, much more than a legal historian. Uh, but my understanding is that it was pretty effective, right? I mean, I think before this, people were using all sorts of different law code books, and it was sort of hit and miss. Um, and I mean, the Fatah Voye al is still, I mean, it was cited for centuries afterwards. I think there are even instances where it's still cited today. Um, so I, th I think it was pretty, pretty effective. You know, I mean, was it, you know, 100% the only thing used in courts deciding for, for Muslim plaintiffs? I have no idea, but, but I think it made a, a pretty big impact. Yeah, there's an article on that, if anyone's interested, I'm sure, in the Eaton edited volume, India's Islamic Institutions. Um, India's Islamic Tradition, sorry. Uh, if I recall from the article, I mean, it gets, it gets used decently, um, but to remember that in, 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 um, in, India, there's uh, there's also like significant Shafi areas and Shiite areas and things, but uh, yeah, the Fatawa Alangiri is still used today. Um, there's a you know, it's just a comprehensive Hanafi manual, uh, unlike pretty much any other. Um, it's, you know, it's uh, it's even used in the um, you know outside of India. Um, we got a question from Dr. Mehfuz. I've just unmuted her. And you can show yourself on the camera if possible. So we can't hear you. We can't hear you. If you want to put your, raise your volume, please. Sorry, the volume is low. Maybe type the question. Yeah, just type the question. It'd be probably better. Oh, yeah. yeah okay, she's probably going to type the question. Okay. I think we have another person who raised their hand. Uh, Rizwan, you just type the question, bro. You've got too many questions coming through. <laughs> I mean, there's one. There's one question about this. The guy, the the kind of. 
antinomian mystic Sarmed that he executes and he Sarmed's a really yeah. interesting interesting character as I recall is he just sort of a like a gadfly that is causing too much problems or too too <laughs> too controversial to be allowed to survive uh, Sarmad is certainly causing a lot of issues. Um, I mean, like, there's many issues with him. His, his religious identity, he's going around saying all this crazy stuff. Um, he also goes around naked sometimes. Like that, like, that, like wearing clothes, pretty big you know, <laughs> cultural norm in the <laughs> fire. Um, I mean, really do not underestimate the importance of it. Like, <laughs> like you know, not wearing clothes, big problem. Um, you know, I think I, th I attribute Sarmad's execution in large part to his sort of acquaintance with, with Dara Chacot. Um, but I don't think we can attribute it entirely to that. Uh, general Mughal practice was after you beat your brothers and kill them or blind them or you know, drive them out of India, whatever you're going to do with, with them. And then after you take the throne, then you integrate their followers into the Mughal state, right? So there were not negative consequences if like, you know, one Rajput chose like the wrong guy and, you know, fought the imperial army. Like generally everyone sort of comes together. And uh, that was very good for the Mughal state. I think Sarmad might be a little bit of an exception because he didn't actually have like political power or a community of any sort. He was just like this individual wandering around sort of, you know, being flamboyant and, and sort of causing issues. Um, I also think Aurangzeb probably just didn't like what he was saying. So. But uh, I mean, one, you know, along the lines of integration, uh, Aurangzeb, I think he marries either his granddaughter or his daughter to Sepir Shiko, the one of the sons of Dar Shiko, right? So correct. He, so he's, I mean, he, the integration even occurs with the children of the brothers. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think the idea was that, you know, the, the kids are not to blame. Uh, and Dar Shiko's two sons are both still quite young. I say like 12 and 14, roughly during the war of succession, right? So, you know, they're not really wielding their own resources yet. Um, you know, and so what are you going to do? Unless you're just going to actually kill off the entire family, which I think, it, you know, that was not standard Mughal practice, that, that would not have been taken too kindly. Um, then you need to make them part of your family so that they have a stake in, in the Mughal kingdom. Thank you. Um, I think that we've got a lot more questions. And I think uh, we're, Jack's your birthday, man. You need to go and spend some time. I feel that. bad. It's like my birthday is causing other people problems. No, 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 no. Look, I think the best thing would be people need to buy the book, read the book, revive the study of Aurangzeb and Islamic in India. I think that's the learning thing. You can't learn something over a Zoom. Uh, you can get some basic information. But if you're really interested, folks, uh, as Dr. Audrey said, there's many manuscripts in Calcutta. Why don't you go and learn some Sanskrit? Go and learn some Farsi. Um, we gain, we study your history. We don't have many um, intellectuals and historians, uh, you know, dwelling into the subject. This is just a nice icebreaker, an introduction to the whole thing. We'd like to thank uh, Dr. Audrey, Jonathan as well. Would, would you like to sum up and um, close up? Well, I mean, I would just say, you know, uh, not only read the Orangza book, which is, I mean, it's a, it's sort of a, you know, it's not a big book. I mean, it's a kind of fun. Mm. Uh, accessible read. It's very, I mean, it's very well done. It's just not, it's not like a brick, you know, you don't, it's not going to intimidate you to death. Uh, but I would also really recommend the cult, the culture of encounters, uh, her first book, which, you know, I was a little, you know, I was like, ah, Sanskrit, nah, I'm not that interested in Sanskrit, but I, I actually thought it was, I mean, I just think it's so important to, to really understand the Mughals as an Indian um, state, you know, as, as, as people who are trying to understand how to like, how to be Indian rulers and that the, the, the culture of encounters book is really helpful. And it um, kind of unlocks a lot of things about Mughal imperial elite life that maybe are a little bit mystifying when people come from outside that like the weird obsession with astrology and chronograms and all this stuff. Um, and uh, whoever, I think it was Rizwan, can you take a nice picture of the mosque, Aurangzeb's mosque and his grave? Send them to me. Or, I yeah. I think it's Danish, I think it was. Okay. Yeah, Danish. Okay, yeah, sorry. Send them to me and uh, I would love those. And um, yeah, I would, I'm would. i really happy to, to have gotten a chance to meet uh, Dr. Audrey, at least on Zoom. Thank you. Dr. Audrey, final comments and thoughts before we close? Um, 
Yeah. So, so thanks so much for having me. This has been, been so much fun. Um, you know, again, I encourage people to keep reading and keep thinking, right? You know, again, my Oren said book is not meant to be the final word, right? Read it and disagree with parts of it. Just make sure that you disagree for real solid historical reasons, right? Uh, the last thing I'll just mention in closing uh, is that I do have a third book coming out. Uh, it will be out in January of 2021. And I'm sad to say I'm forgetting the title because we changed the title at the last minute. Really should have looked that up. But anyways, it is on Sanskrit histories of Indo-Muslim rule from the late 12th century into the early 18th century. So we all you know that we know Pers we all know that we use Persian sources to reconstruct mm. this sort of Indo-Muslim period of, of Indian history. Uh, but there are actually Sanskrit historical sources, and I survey about three dozen of them in the book. I'm specifically interested in how they depict the Muslim other. Right, and as it turns out, uh, they don't talk about them as Muslim very often, and they usually don't talk about them as other either. Mm, Look for that. Fantastic. Once again, thank you so much, Jack. Happy birthday, Dr. Audrey. Thank you so much, folks. Just to remind everyone, think if you have, we will send you a link or a copy of the recording. Um, if you haven't left your email address or you're not registered, leave it on the chat right now. Just a reminder: our session on Wednesday is with Modulum Khan. He wrote the two-volume Muslim heritage uh, of Bengal. Uh, I worked with him on getting some of the manuscripts as well. So if you want to join us, um, we, do, we took a lot of time going through some Sanskrit um, uh, manuscripts as well as those in Persian as well as uh, Turkish ones as well, surprisingly. And on Friday, we will have our discussion on what does Iqbal think of, what would Iqbal think of Pakistan today? Uh, Honest to have uh, Dr. Professor Iftikhar Malik, uh, from Bath, as well as uh, Alama Iqbal's grandson, Salahuddin Iqbal, joining us as well. Thank you so much. Inshallah, uh, hope to see you folks soon. Khudafiz, everybody. Khudafiz. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.